You're listening to episode 32 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the show, everyone. Today, we are taking a deep and delicious dive into the low FODMAP diet. Now, this diet is designed for people who suffer from IBS. That's irritable bowel syndrome. It's a condition that is a lot more common than you might think. And my guest today is registered dietitian and cookbook author, Kate Scarlatta. Together, we're going to walk you through the symptoms of IBS, what triggers it. And then we're going to talk, most importantly, about all of the dietary solutions. And that's where this low FODMAP diet comes in. I know it sounds like a funny name, but it's a really powerful diet. Kate Scarlatta, she's a friend of mine. She's a registered dietitian based in the Boston area. She's a New York Times best-selling author. She has over 25 years of experience working in digestive health. She's a world-renowned low FODMAP map diet and gut health expert. And her passion, as you're going to hear on the show today, is to really advocate for people and for her patients who have gut disorders. And part of her advocacy work includes a grassroots campaign that she started called I Believe in Your Story, which has helped to raise uh, research funding for IBS and to raise awareness. Um, Kate is the author of several cookbooks, including the 21 Day Tummy Diet, the 21 Day Tummy Cookbook, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Eating Well with IBS, and then her most recent cookbook, which I have in my hot little hands right now, is called The Low FODMAP Diet Step by Step. So, you guessed it. I am giving away a copy, U.S. only, please. And to enter the giveaway, just head on over to Liz's Healthy Table. You'll see a tab at the top of the website for the podcast page. Head on over there. Click through to the show notes page for episode 32, and you can enter the giveaway that way. So on the show today, we're going to talk IBS. We're also going to talk recipes because, you know, when you hear the word diet, you think restriction, but actually this diet is a lot more liberal than you would think. And it's also a temporary diet. This is really important to note. So one of the recipes that I just made from the cookbook that we're going to talk about is for a shrimp and broccoli stir fry. So filled with flavor, easy to make. Kate's got some recipes she's going to share with you as well. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com, your one-stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. The show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. Now, this is an app. It's filled with parenting podcasts, including shows like The Dad Experience. I've kind of been listening through all of the shows, and I like to give a shout out to some of my favorites. So The Dad Experience, even though it's a dad show, moms can listen to, and it's a show that will make you laugh, sometimes make you cry, and it's really all about the fatherhood journey. So give it up for The Dad Experience. You can learn all about that show and many more by downloading. Parents on Demand to your phone. You can learn all about it at parentsondemand.com. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Really great to be here, Liz. So before we kind of dig in today to irritable bowel syndrome, and trust me, people, this is a food show, but we could still talk about IBS. It's an important topic, and we're going to talk about the low FODMAP diet. But Kate, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? Tell me about your kids. Who are you? <laughs> Tell us All about right. yourself. 
So I am a registered dietitian. I've been in the nutrition biz for 30 years. I'm a mom of three kids. I have a daughter and two sons, a really crazy chocolate lab who I take a lot of walks on the beach at my main cottage. I live full-time in Medway, Massachusetts. And I'm the youngest of nine kids from an Irish-German family that my dad immigrated, you know, over from Germany. And I love talking nutrition. So let's go. So you're the youngest of nine. So what was dinner like at your household growing up? We talk a lot about family mealtime on my show. I cannot imagine what that table would have looked like. <laughs> Tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's a special memory. My mom always cooked a meal because it was cheaper, obviously, to actually prepare meals than go out with nine kids. Mm -hmm. And we had specific seats at the table. We had a really long dinner table. And the youngest daughter to the oldest daughter was on one side of the table, and I was closest to my mom. And the oldest son was closest to the, actually, the youngest son was closest to my dad up to the oldest. So we kind of had this special order that we just had to sit at. My parents rang a bell because we were always outside just having fun. And if we didn't hear it, someone else heard it. And it said, the bell rang, you better get there for dinner. We always sat down and had a really nice cooked meal with my mom. Did you have to eat fast, though, because there were so many mouths to feed? And if you didn't eat fast, you wouldn't get the food? Or was there plenty to go around and it was more relaxed? Because I know people who come from these giant families, and it was always a little bit more of a mosh pit at the dinner table. Yeah, I have to say my mom made plenty of food, so I never felt like I had to rush at the dinner table. One of the things that uh, was always a little challenge was a box of popsicles, or if we had individual like frozen treats in the summertime, you kind of had to get your dibs in on those, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or you were you know kind of out of it. You missed it. You missed the opportunity. But I didn't feel like we had to rush at dinner time, okay. which was great. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall, but hey, now you've got your three kids. I know your daughter's getting married, I think, in the next couple of months. So you've got a yeah. lot going on. I do. Yes, my daughter's getting married in Greece. So we're really excited about, you know, a special trip and a special event. Well, I hope everybody after listening will start following Kate because Kate posts beautiful pictures on Instagram. What's your Instagram handle? It's just Kate Scarlotta, one word. And we need to follow you because you post beautiful low FODMAP food photos and you do personal photos too. So everybody, you need to, you got to follow Kate. But anyway, so irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. What exactly is IBS? Is it common or is it not so common? Like, what are we talking about here? Right. So we're actually talking about a very common disorder that impacts about up to one in five Americans. So a lot of people are affected by IBS. It runs a, a spectrum. So some people are really debilitated by IBS and others, it's kind of a nuance to their life, but they go about life pretty easily. But in general, in a nutshell, it's a motility disorder. So the intestine doesn't move in a coordinated fashion. And because of that, gas and liquids in the gut can trap and stretch the gut and make it feel uncomfortable. And there's also some science to show that the gut and the brain, they're derived from the same cells in utero. So when you're growing as a baby, the gut and brain have the, the same cells and they kind of take off. So the gut and the brain are really highly, you know, interactive. And we think of the gut actually as a second brain. So in IBS, there seems to be some kind of dysregulation between the gut and the brain. And probably in part, a player in this is our gut microbes, which appear to be altered in individuals with irritable bowel syndrome. So people with IBS are going to have either like constipation or diarrhea. They might have a lot of gas and they're just uncomfortable, right? It's like a miserable thing to have IBS, right? It is, especially, you know, if the majority of people with IBS have symptoms with eating. So, you know, every time you eat, if you have to think like, oh, is this going to cause me a bellyache, it really can be disrupting. So, you know, you mentioned the whole gut microbe thing. And what exactly like causes IBS? I mean, is it that your gut microbes are out of whack? Is it certain foods? Like who's the person out there who's going to end up with IBS? So there seems to be a genetic component. So, you know, 
there might be some kind of gene piece to it. There's also a connection with foodborne illness. So if you have a severe foodborne illness event, especially if you're a woman, that can precipitate IBS as well. And the sort of the vast majority, we really don't know. We don't know why and who will get IBS. But people come to you and they say, hey, Kate, I'm having all these GI issues. I think I have IBS. Like, do you rule other stuff out or do you just say, yep, you got gas, you got IBS? Like, how do you know really that they have IBS? Right. So they really need to see a doctor to be fully evaluated to rule out, you know, alarm conditions, cancer. We want an individual with GI symptoms to have celiac disease, for instance, ruled out before I start altering or mucking around with their diet. Because when you have to have gluten in your diet for the test to be accurate for celiac disease. So we want to make sure that they're in the good hands of a GI doctor or their primary care doctor to just rule out some of these other conditions conditions first and then decide, well, it does sound, you know, you do have, in fact, IBS and then come up with some treatment to help manage the symptoms. So should people who have IBS go on medication? Should they go on a low FODMAP diet, which is something we're really going to dig into on today's show? So what's kind of the first line when somebody comes to you and you all determine you, the doctor, okay, Mary's got IBS. Like, What do you do? How do you help her? Right. So, well, patients come to me, you know, they're interested in a nutritional approach to managing symptoms. So, you know, if that's the case and they've tried some general, you know, I always have to make sure that they've maybe tried a little psyllium husk. Have they cleaned up their diet and got rid of some of the junk food? You know, done some general cleanup of their diet to make sure that in itself isn't enough. Some people do well on psyllium husk with IBS, which is, you know, a metamucil would be an example of psyllium husk. That might be a first line. Most of the patients that come to my office, however, have already done those kind of treatments and it hasn't helped them. And so in that case, I would personally start the low FODMAP diet. But it really depends on the patient. The patient has a lot of different treatment options. Some may want to try a medication. Some may want to try probiotics. Some may want to try an antibiotic if it's suitable. For instance, there's antibiotics for irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea predominance. So there's sort of a gamut of treatments and the patient should be a big player in deciding which treatment they would like to try first. Mm, You know, years ago, my husband actually reached out to you, Kate, I recommend it. He reached out to you and he ended up going on Metamucil and suddenly he felt great. So whatever was bothering his GI system, he went on Metamucil twice a day. And he's so funny. Like if we're out with friends, he'll talk about the Metamucil when he's, (laughs) and Metamucil is awesome. I mean, that, you know, it's like, it's a great, great tool to have in your toolbox. And so Tim did great on that. But other people, like you said, may not respond or maybe that's just not enough. Exactly. So you've really become sort of this champion of the low FODMAP diet. And I remember when I first heard about it, I could not get it in my head. FODMAPs, like what is that? I know. It's a weird acronym, but what does FODMAP stand for? And then tell us why this diet is so powerful when it comes to treating people with IBS. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to say some sciencey words. Don't get caught up in them. But the acronym itself stands for F is fermentable. O stands for oligosaccharides. D, disaccharide, M, monosaccharide, and A is and, and P is polyol. And basically what these big, long science terms mean are they're really referring to a group of commonly malabsorbed carbohydrates that are fast food for our gut bacteria and microbes. And because they're small, they pull water in. And that extra gas in the water stretches the gut and can be a player in exacerbating some of these classic IBS symptoms of bloating and gas and diarrhea. So if somebody consumes one of these FODMAP sugars or carbohydrates, because maybe apples are high in one of them or onions are high in one of these FODMAPs, suddenly what happens is the gut bacteria starts chomping away on them, eating them. And one of the byproducts of eating them sort of aggressively would be fermentation and gas. And then also these sugars are just not naturally absorbed well by people with IBS. Am I getting that right? 
Well, you know, they're really not absorbed well by many of us with IBS or not, but the individual with IBS seems to not handle the byproducts of the fermentation and the osmotic effects. And then also, the bacteria, in addition to creating gas when they eat FODMAPs, there's all sorts of metabolites that they produce as well. And those may also be a factor in exacerbating symptoms. So remember, the individual with IBS has an altered bacteria makeup, so they could be making different types of byproducts when they eat FODMAPs. And they also have a very sensitive gut. They don't handle this extra gas and fluid as well as someone with a healthy gut. Okay, so me, I can eat all these FODMAP foods. I'm fine. But somebody with IBS... They're not fine. So what are some of these foods? Because this is going to surprise people. Some of the foods are really healthy. And you're telling people, "Mm, cut these out for a while. Exactly. But just remember, it is a temporary diet. It's a learning diet, which we'll get into in a moment. But some of the foods that are high in FODMAPs are very random. Watermelon, apples, pears, mango, asparagus, artichokes, wheat, onion, cabbage. So different types of cabbage have different types of FODMAPs. Some are okay, some are not. So it's a very nuanced diet and really benefits from help with a dietitian that understands all these nuances to help guide the individual that wants to do the diet. Yeah, I have several friends who have complained about lots of gas and bloating, and I've always sent them to katescarlotta.com to your website. And I say, you know what, just check it out. Maybe cut out some of these FODMAP foods for a while. See how you feel. Like, do onions bother you? Oh my gosh, yes. Well, then cut them out. See if it helps. But I think if you're going to really follow FODMAP, you need to follow it in an organized, systematic way so that you could really figure out those trigger foods. So talk us through how somebody would actually start to follow a low FODMAP diet. And I will say, by the way, the low FODMAP diet step-by-step, that's Kate's latest cookbook, offers an awesome primer on the low FODMAP diet. The recipes are spectacular. And I'm going to tell you about one of the recipes I made in a little bit. And it doesn't have to be sort of this intimidating diet. So kind of walk us through how people would follow a low FODMAP diet. Exactly. So an individual would come to me and I'd take a look at their diet and get just an overall sense of where their FODMAPs are coming in. So it's really good to just take an overview of the diet and see, you know, is there a lot of wheat? Is there a lot of onion, garlic, apples, dates in certain, you know, granola bars can be really high in dates and honey. So we would look at the overall plan and then we would substitute in foods that are low in FODMAPs. So for instance, if an individual was eating uh, Lara bars that have a lot of dates, which have a lot of FODMAPs in them, I would have them switch over to like an 88 acres. They have a number of different bars, but they have a dark chocolate bar that's great. Or I might switch them over to Fody Foods, which has a low FODMAP bar. Or, you know, come up with rice cake and peanut butter instead for their low FODMAP snack instead of something that is high. So it's really just substituting in foods that are high FODMAP in their diet with foods that are lower in FODMAPs to see how they do. So it's, it doesn't have to be really difficult or scientific. It just really requires a knowledge of high FODMAP foods versus low FODMAP foods. I was surprised to see that beans are a high FODMAP food. And meanwhile, we talk about beans all the time as being one of these really healthy foods and good foods for your gut. You know, a lot of these FODMAP foods actually are high in fiber. I've done a show on the microbiome and I always say you want to eat a lot of high fiber foods. You want to eat lots of fruits and veggies. That's what feeds your gut bacteria. And now you're saying some of those very foods we've been recommending might literally be fast food for the good bacteria, but they just eat them too aggressively or whatever that scenario might be. You know, it seems counterintuitive, but then the way you explain it, it makes sense. Yeah. And the thing is, with a low FODMAP diet, it is true. We are removing a lot of what we call prebiotic foods, but we're not removing all prebiotic foods. And prebiotics, just to back up, are basically food that feeds our good probiotic bacteria preferentially. And there's there's Oats have prebiotics, and those are allowed on the low FODMAP diet. There's a lot of fruits and vegetables that are allowed on the low FODMAP diet that are rich in polyphenols, which offer some 
prebiotic benefits as well. So it's a matter of really just pulling out some of these common triggers, prebiotic foods or high fiber foods, but replacing them with other high fiber containing healthy fruits and vegetables, just different ones that are a little less you know, problematic typically in the IBS patient. So do you have to give up FODMAP foods forever or is this a temporary diet? It's really a temporary diet, and thank you for bringing that up. So it's really a three-phase diet. We eliminate the high FODMAP foods anywhere from two to four weeks, and sometimes six weeks, depending on the individual. But usually by two to four weeks, we get a baseline. Do the individual with IBS respond? Are they feeling much better? Great. Then we do the reintroduction, which is a very systematic way that we add FODMAPs back in, really to help determine which FODMAPs were triggering their symptoms and also to identify which FODMAPs were not triggering their symptoms. And then the last phase is this personalization phase where we add back the FODMAPs that were not triggering their symptoms so that we are expanding their diet, but at the same time managing the symptoms. Kate, let me ask you personally why you got so interested in IBS and this low FODMAP diet. And then trust me, people, we'll get back to more food in a minute, but I want to just hear your personal story. Like, why are you so into this? I know. So I really got into this. I was working with a lot of IBS patients and really felt like there was nothing I could do. I would try to modify fiber. We really didn't have any treatments that really moved to the bar. Maybe tried low lactose, maybe tried reducing, you know, some sugar alcohols like sorbitol, but really wasn't moving the bar for their symptom management. And then I experienced sort of a life-changing event. I was pregnant with my second child. I was three months pregnant and I developed this like colicky, just pain in my belly that was just a little worrisome for me. It did not feel like anything I had ever experienced before. And so I arrived to the, my obstetrician and she admitted me immediately. And within 24 hours, I was under the knife, having surgery, they were exploring my belly to see what was causing the pain. And they found that my intestine, my small intestine was strangled by scar tissue from, I had had an ovarian cyst removed when I was 18. And so the strangulation of the scar tissue actually really, it took all the blood flow from my small intestine, six feet of my small intestine had to be removed. And so after that, really my stomach became much more intolerant. My intestine became a lot more intolerant to a lot of different foods. And when I learned about the low FODMAP diet for my patients with IBS, I thought, this makes so much sense. All the foods that are high in FODMAPs are the ones that I've been avoiding, that I've noted were really triggering my symptoms. So the diet itself, has really been life-changing, not only for my patients, but absolutely for me. Do you still follow a low FODMAP diet? Are there foods that you still have to avoid? So I've really learned that it's not any one food that really trips me up. It's the quantity. And so if there's a little onion in something, I'm fine with that. But I would never order an onion, a bowl of onion soup. It looks beautiful. I would love to have it, but I would be sick as a dog. So there's just certain foods in large quantities. If, like if there was a little onion on a slice of pizza, I could have a slice of pizza. If I wouldn't sit down and eat half of a pizza, I'd love to, but that doesn't always agree with me. So it's really quantity related, and that's true for some patients. So they may find they can include all high FODMAP foods, just not in copious amounts. Hmm. You have walked the walk, you talk the talk. And I know you have worked with so many patients uh, virtually, you've worked with them one on one. And I know this is going to be a hard question. But is there a patient out there someone you have worked with who responded so well to this low FODMAP diet that it was literally life changing for them. Give us a story. Tell us about somebody who just sort of jumps out in your mind. I absolutely will. And I have to tell you that the bulk of my patients, it has been life changing. I can't tell you how many times patients come in really like dragging their knuckles. And on the second visit, they're dancing, they're hugging us. It's like the most rewarding work, honestly, as a dietitian. I can't even, it's been so gratifying. So I can't even like, I will share one story, but honestly, 
the bulk of my patients have gone from misery to traveling the globe and living their life, having babies, they were putting off pregnancy because their GI symptoms were so bad, to receiving multiple sonograms and emails. Like it's been extraordinarily rewarding work. But I did have one woman that came in that I could just think of off the top of my head, and she was experiencing IBS. She had interstitial cystitis, which is painful bladder syndrome, and she was on a very restrictive, specific carbohydrate diet and really losing weight, very concerned. And the specific carbohydrate diet is really not an evidence. They're, they're using it a little bit in inflammatory bowel disease, but it's a very, very restrictive diet. And we moved her from that to a low FODMAP diet without any problem. And she went from losing weight to feeling miserable and weak and just not really even feeling well to gaining weight, flourishing, traveling the globe. It just was so dramatic. And now she's really liberalized the low FODMAP diet. So there's just certain trigger foods that she knows to avoid. But overall, I would say it's very minimal restrictions that she really has to stick with. So it's been very rewarding to watch her journey. Fantastic. What about exercise? You know, Jody, who's in my podcast posse, and by the way, for those of you listening, just so you know, I have a closed group on Facebook, Liz's Podcast Posse. I have a link to it in the sidebar of my podcast page on Liz's Healthy Table. And I invite you to join the posse because you can ask all sorts of questions. And so Jody wants to know about the role of exercise and yoga with IBS. And she also had a question about sugar, like everyday sugar. Is that okay? Or what about artificial sweeteners? So talk a little bit about exercise and then switch gears and give me the scoop on sugar. You got it. So exercise, there is some evidence, especially in constipation, that any kind of weight-bearing exercise can really stimulate colonic motility, which is good for an individual that's prone to constipation. So there's a little evidence there. There is evidence that yoga can be helpful for individuals with IBS. There was a study, I believe, that just came out last year on that. But overall, we, we really have very little quality evidence looking specifically at IBS. IBS and exercise. From clinical experience, I can tell you that patients do really well with moderate exercise, not intense exercise. So running, like for instance, endurance athletes tend to be prone to diarrhea and it actually can exacerbate some of these symptoms when they're doing very high intensity endurance. So more moderate activity like yoga and walking are two that seem to benefit patients but again, the evidence for this area is kind of, it's, there's just not a lot of information out there in the science literature. Sure, sure. And then what about sugar and artificial sweeteners? Yeah, so sugar itself is not a FODMAP, granulated sugar. So brown sugar's fine, maple syrup's fine. Of course, you know, these are devoid of nutrition. So for all, you know, we don't want to lose sight of the big picture, right? So if someone wanted to make a low FODMAP chocolate chip cookie and enjoy that, absolutely go for it. It shouldn't trigger your symptoms. But as an overall arching nutrition message, don't have a lot of it because it's devoid of nutrition. And then from an artificial sweeteners perspective, they're not really bearing up too well when we look at their effect on the gut microbiome. So um, Splenda, for instance, or sucralose has been associated with reducing the healthy probiotic gut microbes. And then the sorbitol, mannitol, and xylitol, those kind of sugar alcohols that are added to sugar-free gum and mints, those are sources of FODMAP. So for individuals with IBS, Yes, they could certainly be triggers for symptoms. So that's really good to know. But this is another interesting question from Susan from the Posse. And she says, I don't have GI issues. However, I recently started taking in more probiotics. So she's drinking kombucha, which, by the way, I do too, Susan. She's eating more yogurt and she's doing it like once a day. But then she said, as a result, it has made her gassy and it has messed with her GI system a little bit. And she says, how could I adjust my diet to help out with this? So you just have to remember that, you know, the microbes that live in our gut 
in itself, it's a very fragile ecosystem. And so when you're adding in a lot of bugs through probiotic rich foods, it's kind of like you're adding a bunch of new dogs to the dog park. Are they all going to get along? How are they reacting to one another? Sometimes that it works beautifully. Everyone plays well together. Sometimes it doesn't. So what my recommendation would be to Susan is to back off the kombucha, back off the yogurt, let her gut settle down, and then start up a little bit maybe less rambunctiously. You know, maybe try a little a cup of kombucha a day and see how you do, and then slowly add in the yogurt. Kind of titrate slowly. Just remember that it is a gentle ecosystem and not everyone's going to you know, adapt as well. The other option is to try a different kind of kombucha that might have different kinds of probiotics that may play better with the bugs that are already in your gut. And it's so funny with the kombucha. I love it. And I love this brand. Mm -hmm. It's called Synergy. But the flavor is Trilogy, I believe. Anyway, it's sort of fruity and I literally crave it. And I have to just drink half a bottle. I won't drink a whole bottle because this is like, I don't want to overdo it. Right. Right. But it just, right. I must crave it because maybe my gut wants it. I don't know. I love it. Some people don't like it, but I just think it's awesome. Yeah, I think that having probiotic-rich foods is a good idea. Just know that different probiotics may or may not get along with the, the microbes that are already in your gut and to really be intuitive and listen to your body. Just because you hear probiotics are good, it might be that probiotics in a certain food just don't interact well with the players that are already in your gut and just back off a little bit, maybe even in portion or try an alternative brand to see if that settles better in your gut. Good. Totally makes sense. Hope that helps you out, Susan. So I'm holding here in my hot little hand, Kate's book, The Low FODMAP Diet Step by Step. And you have 130 deliciously satisfying recipes in the book. You co-wrote it with Dee Dee Wilson, who's a phenomenal recipe developer. And so I decided to make your shrimp and broccoli stir fry. Now, this is a recipe that if you're on a low FODMAP diet or any diet, you would look at this recipe and say, well, this is fabulous. I don't feel deprived at all. And so I want to share this recipe, which you make with half a cup of either chicken stock or shrimp stock or even water. You also call for two tablespoons of low sodium soy sauce a teaspoon of cornstarch, a teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes, a teaspoon of sugar. You call for two tablespoons of garlic-infused oil, and I cheated and I just used oil. I think I used olive oil. You call for two tablespoons of peeled and finely julienned fresh ginger, so huge flavor there. Mm -hmm. Two cups of small broccoli florets and a pound of large shrimp, peeled and deveined two teaspoons of toasted sesame oil, and a quarter cup of chopped scallion. That's the green parts only. And the way you make this recipe, it's super easy. And I am going to post this on my blog, if that's okay with you, Kate. I'd love to share this recipe. Yes, of course. We'll just give you the attribution for the book, but perfect. Yeah, great, great, great. So you can check out this recipe at Liz's Healthy Table. But you basically just combine the stock or the water with the soy sauce and the cornstarch and the red pepper flakes, the sugar, and then you set that aside. And then in a wok or a large skillet, I happen to use a wok, you just heat the oil over medium heat. You kind of stir fry up the ginger. You add the broccoli. You stir fry that for two minutes. Cooks up quickly because these are small little florets. You add the shrimp and the shrimp cook up really quickly. I actually used frozen shrimp that I just thawed out. 30 seconds for that. They just turn a little bit pink. Then you add in that stock mixture and then just kind of let everything cook and bubble up till the shrimp cooks through. And then you drizzle the sesame oil into the mixture if you're using that. And I did. I love it. You add some scallion greens and you're done. And you've got this beautiful dinner, which I actually served over brown rice because I know for low FODMAP, you do eliminate wheat as part of that initial diet. So I used brown rice and then it was so funny because the recipe doesn't call for that. But I was like, I'm going to add some brown rice. And then I went into this little mini panic. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> wait a minute, is brown rice even allowed? So yes. uh, I saw that it was. It's good whole grain. So I just used one of these boil in a bag because I'm super lazy when it comes to rice. Yes. And it was delicious. And so the point being that, yeah, it's on the low FODMAP diet, but a lot of great 
veggies in there, shrimp, delicious. We want to eat more seafood, certainly get that into our diets. So I love it. I love that recipe. Yeah, so good. I think, you know, if you really can do a healthy low FODMAP diet, there's a lot of healthy foods, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, even the broccoli, which people think are off limits for gas producing, but in the right portion, it's totally fine. And that is such a yummy dish. And brown rice certainly, you know, is a nice add in. Awesome. And what about you, Kate? Like when you go through the book, because I'm sure you love every recipe, but do you have or your family Do you have a favorite right now, maybe something that's in season or something that you just kind of crave all the time? What do you love in the book? Well, you know, I have to say I love the peanut noodles because Mm. I love a good Asian inspired dish like the dish you just mentioned. I love sesame oil. And so anytime that's incorporated, so good. So the peanut noodles are really good. They're made with a rice based noodle. So, again, wheat free, but delicious. You know, I'm a comfort food person, so I also really love the cheesy grits. I went to Emory University for two and a half years. That's where I started my college experience. And grits were like my pre-exam meal. And um, so I love the cheesy grits. Again, you know, probably not summertime fare, but very delicious. And really my favorite, and I hate to admit this as a dietitian, Mm -hmm. but my ultimate favorite recipe in the cookbook is the chocolate walnut brownies. They are like the best brownie ever, like almost like a flourless chocolate cake brownie mix. And they're just amazing. They come out perfect every time. Yeah. So those are the three off the top of my head that I really like. But, you know, there's a ton. Chicken saute is very good. We have some really interesting like granola style bars. We also have a really nice grilled swordfish with a pineapple salsa, which is fun for the summer. But yeah, there's really a nice mix of recipes, I have to say. I am looking. I just turned to the chocolate walnut brownie recipe. It looks so good. And you do call for a gluten-free all-purpose flour, such as Bob's Red Mill. So these are easy to find now in the supermarket. You know, it used to be that gluten-free was weird, you know, or even FODMAP now. You can find some products in the market that are designed for people following this diet. Absolutely. So it's expanding in the U.S., but more and more grocery stores are starting to carry low FODMAP options. There's a number of companies that are jumping in and are getting their food products certified low FODMAP by either the FODMAP friendly company or the Monash University company. These are sort of two leaders in certifying products as low FODMAP. So you'll start seeing those logos on foods. You know, as I mentioned, up to one in five Americans are affected by IBS. So there's a marketplace for these types of products and it really does help to have a variety out there so patients can get on and enjoy their life and have a calm mm, belly. We need a calm belly. Is IBS on the rise though? Because you know we always talk about the American lifestyle, how we're all stressed out. We eat a lot of processed foods. We don't play outside as much in nature, you know, and that's where you get a lot of those good bacteria into your system. So is it on the rise or is it just that we're diagnosing it more? You know, most GI conditions are on the rise. I don't know specifically about IBS increasing, but we're seeing, you know, gastro esophageal reflux disease. So, you know, any kind of heartburn diseases, we're seeing inflammatory bowel disease on the rise. IBS itself, I'm not sure, to be honest, that it's increasing. We are definitely hearing about it more. And in part, I think because people are getting more comfortable to talk about it and raise questions. Everyone's kind of interested and hyped about the gut microbiome and how our microbes impact health. So I think in part, there is a raised awareness Yeah. Yeah. And people are embarrassed, right? To talk about gas and poop and, you know, diarrhea or whatever, you know, and again, it's a food show, but it's something that if one in five people experience it, then we need to talk about it. Absolutely need to talk about it because a lot of people are suffering in silence and that's no place to live, right? So we want to be able to talk about it and be more comfortable. I think the poop emoji really made talking about poop a little bit more comfortable. I really believe that. (laughs) And, you know, we're seeing people are interested. There's poop pillows and poop mugs and poop this. And I think that's good, you know, because anything that starts the dialogue is important. People shouldn't be, you know, suffering in silence. They should get the help they need. And if that means just modifying their diet and FODMAPs and figuring out what their trigger items are and then getting on with living, yeah, let's do it. 
before I ask you a little bit more about your website and all the resources you've got, I want to just get to one more question from Teresa. Now, I told everybody on the Posse that this was a show on IBS and low FODMAP, but Teresa said that her son has Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, RA. And she said she's always been interested in learning more about how food can decrease the inflammation in the body. So for somebody with an inflammatory condition, can diet play a role? You know, what's really interesting to me and kind of sad is that there isn't a lot of diet research for inflammatory bowel disease. You would think there would be because it's a significantly debilitating condition. But what I can tell you is when they've looked at sort of patterns, dietary patterns, and what dietary patterns increase risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease, we see a connection between emulsifiers in food, ultra-processed foods, so things like refined carbohydrates. A lot of the polyunsaturated fats are linked, while omega-3 fats, such as those found in many nuts and seeds and salmon, are actually protective. We also see dietary patterns where individuals that consume more fruits and vegetables have lower risk. So I would say when we're thinking about inflammation and autoimmune diseases, My recommendations to clients that I work with is to eat mostly whole foods, less packaged, processed foods, minimize emulsifiers in foods that would be listed as carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbate ADR2 that are in particular been associated with increasing inflammation. And then the other thing regarding the low FODMAP diet, IBD, individuals with inflammatory bowel disease, a bulk of those patients also have kind of this overlapping IBS-like symptom profile. And in those patients, it, the low FODMAP diet can be helpful. So it might be a consideration for your caller's son. One thing that's been interesting regarding low FODMAP diet and inflammation, the low FODMAP diet does seem to reduce LPS, which is a bacterial metabolite, lipopolysaccharide, and LPS is associated with gut inflammation and gut permeability. So there is some benefit, there's potential, we need to understand this metric a little bit more, but that the low FODMAP diet may also be somewhat protective to the gut in certain individuals. So more to go on this, but I would say, you know, just more whole food, less processed foods and a nice healthy balance of fruits and vegetables, sort of Mediterranean-like style diet would be the way I would go. So Teresa can certainly come over to your website. All of our listeners can come to your website. Tell everybody what they're going to find, katescarlotta.com and how you can kind of jumpstart everyone's journey, you know, when they're thinking about getting rid of those symptoms and getting their gut health into check. Absolutely. So on my website, if you go to katescarlotta.com, there's a FODMAP resource tab. And on that tab, I have a low FODMAP grocery list that's free and downloadable, a high and low FODMAP checklist. I also have a dietitian registry. So if you're looking to work with a dietitian that has knowledge in the low FODMAP diet, there's not a million of us out there. Mm -hmm. So you'd want to find one specific that has good knowledge on the low FODMAP diet. There's a list of those dietitians. And I also have a free downloadable handout called FODMAP 101 that just kind of runs through what are FODMAPs, how do they affect symptoms, what are some high FODMAP foods, just some general information on FODMAPs. And I also have these grab and go passes, which are great for kids with FODMAP sensitivities for the school. It just gives them a little list of what foods would be okay, what would not be okay. And then also a card that you can give to a chef that says, hey, these are trigger foods for me. What foods on your menu would work best? Fantastic. So lots of great resources. And Kate, you have paved the way in this whole field. And, you know, even me personally, I have so many friends that I talk to who I always say, go to Kate's website because it sounds like you. you might have IBS and her diet and her resources might help you out. Anything else you want to share before we let you back to your wonderful life today in Maine, even though you told me it was raining, but it's beautiful where you are. So anything else you want to share before we wrap it up today? 
Absolutely. I mean, just number one, don't self-diagnose yourself. You know, seek guidance from your physician. Make sure that we're not missing any alarm signs such as celiac disease or a more serious condition. So do that first before you decide to jump on the low FODMAP bandwagon. And then also just remember that the diet, the elimination phase of the diet is a short-term diet. We want you to eat a more liberal diet that your body tolerates. So being strict low FODMAP is not a game plan for life. It's really just a starting point, And then we really want you to liberalize. So do remember that it's important that you have a wide variety of foods that work for your body. Fantastic. Kate Scarlata, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me, Liz. That was really fun. Okay, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. I learned a lot. I love Kate's book, so I encourage you to head on over to Liz'sHealthyTable.com and then just check out the show notes, show number 32 from today's show, and then you can enter to win. U.S. only, please, but you can enter to win the giveaway. And then the recipe we talked about, the broccoli shrimp stir fry, that will be on the blog. If you love the show, feel free to post a review subscribe to it on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts, spread the word. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.